Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Good morning. It's nice to see you all. Quite a group of people coming out of bed already early for me. Those, yeah, I have been lodged in a very nice hotel, so they receive me very well here. So they, and they all the time speak nice words, but I think I have to thank them for doing the real work. I mean, uh, Edna has financed, and that is, she makes it a small move, but I think it's quite difficult to, to uh, finance a new way of thinking while the most people uh, try to stay like in the EEG development, which is the traditional development. <clears throat> and she was very much supported by active nurses here in the education also, and so it is really great that Mary fairly organized this meeting and got you all enthusiastic to come. And then I'm also happy that Mark, which I forgot his uh, second name because then you get used to call somebody Mark. And, <laughs> yeah, yes. and so that uh, can be forgiven with my age, I think. So uh, when you have questions afterwards, you have to realize that I'm Dutch old and deaf, so that is, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to speak out quite uh, clearly. But then first I'll uh, tell you something about the focus of our attention, and that is the symptoms instead of the illness. Uh, schizophrenia has been a uh, last stronghold of psychiatry, you could say. And surely when psychiatry had developed into a more biological science, which wasn't the case when I studied psychiatry, we did not believe in any biological. We called psychosis functional illnesses, so that means that people didn't function well because of their complaints. We did not know much about the, uh, the significance of the troubles in their lives that only we discovered very, very much later when we uh, organized the first, no, when I met the first person, uh, Betsy Hager, with whom I started, and she was the one who was very critical. And she said, it's very nice what you all do with diagnosis, but that just doesn't help me. I want to get to know how to cope with my voices. And I then realized that I didn't know anything about that. I'm not trained, and I, we are trained in psychiatry not to go into those experiences. And that's very strange when you, but when you're used to that, it's not strange. It's much stranger to do the normal and go into it. And so there is a real contradiction between those two approaches. So it takes very long time to change professions and I'm more hopeful to change nurses than changing psychiatrists. I know them, these psychiatrists, I myself, they're hard-headed anyhow. And when they have a theory, they keep to the theory. Because they do that already a very long time. Although Bloiler, who started the uh, concept of schizophrenia, did not include hearing voices as an important symptom, but just more as a side issue. They have slowly moved from that concept into a total different concept. And that new concept gets together hearing voices, delusions and social retreat, retreat behavior. And those symptoms together make the diagnosis. And in itself, that is strange because that symptoms together making a diagnosis is not a normal medical way of working. But let's first say something about what is the schizophrenia problem. The first is that there is no scientific proof for all that time. It's already a, over a hundred year a concept, but it has never been proved the validity of the schizophrenia disease concept. The trouble is that many people now have proved that it, is, it has no validity. One of a very intense study starts with 
the validity of schizophrenia is zero because it is an assembling of very many different people with very many different problems. So you can't use it as a diagnosis. You can either use it as a, as a categorization, but not as a diagnosis, because in a diagnosis you have to combine the cause with the symptom, and that together gets you to a diagnosis. That's a normal medical way of diagnosing. But in this, in the traditional concept of schizophrenia, only the, uh, uh, the um, being there, the appearance of symptoms, they put together and make a diagnosis without any involvement of uh, the, uh, the cause. The traditional treatment of schizophrenia therefore focuses on the disease and not on the experience and background of the symptoms and not on discovering their significance in the person's life. Those are very important things which I would like to accentuate because this is the problem why the uh, Let's have a look if I'm the right one. There's no, yes, yes, I did. Uh, this is because uh, this uh, computer is a bit my uh, boss. That's the trouble of these uh, PowerPoints. You're not free anymore to just talk about the subject you're interested in. So, but you have to keep to your, but then you get also to an end. So it is in itself a positive <laughs> thing to do. This is why there might well be no possibility to solve the problem of schizophrenic patients because nobody knows anything about their problems. And generally, you help patients when you learn to know their problems and you try to help, to stimulate, to help to solve their problems, which also is not that easy. I mean, I won't... Uh, make it easier. Schizophrenic patients, as diagnosed with schizophrenia, have different, very difficult problems. That is not the denial here, but the denial is that you should approach these difficulties in a way that is coming a way out to recovery. And the diagnostic way in psychiatry doesn't give any way out to recovery because you don't know the problem. Einstein once said, hey, Einstein is gone. I don't know why. <laughs> well, that's possible, naturally. I, why not? He isn't anymore there. But I can refer to him as, you can't solve a problem using the same kind of reasoning that has created the problem. Now, the trouble in psychiatry is with schizophrenia. They created the problem by making a diagnosis with symptoms that are not the result of the disease. There is not any proof from the relationship between the symptoms and the disease or illness. This is why there might well be no possibility to solve the problem of the schizophrenic patients. As long as you think the symptoms are the result of the disease, you would focus on the disease and not on the symptoms. So you have to change the attitude from focusing on to focusing on the experience and background of the symptoms of the patients. The illness concept does not give any evidence or reason for why a person is diagnosed with schizophrenia would hear voices. There is no any rational reason be, the, that connects the illness or disease of schizophrenia with the symptoms. The relation, the symptom of hearing voices is just, has a total different background, but anyhow, it's not the consequence of the disease. Of disease. It's neither a consequence of the disease because what changed my thinking quite firmly was that we met in the first conference of hearing voices Congress we held in, this, in the end of the 70s. No, end of 1987 it was. Let's not lie. Eh? <laughs> Let's try but not do it. So that, that's, I like to lie. Everybody likes to lie, but I shouldn't do it. Yeah. Okay. 
So with the hearing voices was our first uh, focus and we compared them between about from patients hearing voices and non-patients because we met a lot of people who hear voices and never became patients and that was very wondering it was astonishing because you are trained that hearing voices is a symptom of an illness that's how we all are all trained but that's not reality in reality 4% of the general population, and that has been researched quite well on very many different countries, that 4% of the general population know the experience of hearing voices and only one third of them need some help and only one to one, fifth, five, one and a half percent really gets into the category of uh, schizophrenia. So it's really, uh, so most people hearing voices are never becoming patients. They are inspired by their voices. So that's quite a different way of looking at, at, at perceiving voices. If it, then it's not a psychopathological phenomenon, but a human variation. Then we should more compare it, not in content, but in ID with the homosexuality, which was in, when I was young, and that's long ago, I can imagine, I can assure you. In the 50s, we saw also that, here, that homosexuality was a uh, psychopathological phenomenon, and it still was uh, active, uh, seen as a illness in the DSM. In 1970, they only uh, got it out. So the profession might take time to change things, but research made it clear that hearing voices is a common human variation and not a sign of psychopathology. So we should strive to emancipation of hearing voices because more people hear voices than, than don't become patients than people who are becoming patients. When you really in, uh, get that in mind, you will tell that patients hearing voices as one of the steps to normalize this experience. And then they will not directly believe you in the sense that they are ma very much hindered, but that means that it can be changed. Not everybody has the same future. It opens possibilities to you learn to know your voices better and it opens possibilities for learn to cope with them, to change the relationship because that's the main issue. Hearing voices is something that pe makes people afraid. And why that is, is because the patients hearing voices have a background of traumatic experiences or other psychic conflict like also having a different, a different sexual identity, which is still for a lot of people a difficult situation. So in itself, one hearing voices is not a consequence of, the, there's not related to the diagnosis in itself, but everybody thinks that way. Because when on the street you will tell about hearing voices, they always react with, oh, you mean schizophrenia. And that is what is the, it has been influenced the whole society. And that makes emancipation a bit difficult because it might be that, they, um, that the healthy uh, people hearing voices won't be identified with patients, but they also are not talking about their experience. So we discriminate by this way of uh, looking at hearing voices all the others who know the experience but don't tell, tell about it. And that's the same within mental health professionals. If you have 4% of all your people working in mental health hearing voices, then most of you will not talk about it because you are a little bit afraid to be looked at as a patient and be, be not able to, uh, to do your job. 
And there are only a few now who come forward. And that is the main step, I think, in emancipation, that those who are just healthy voices come forward. And then we have to organize that in a way that they are not identified with the patients, because the patients are not patients because they hear voices, but are patients because they can't cope with their voices. And they have reasons they can't cope, because they can't cope with the very difficult problems they have survived. And that's reasonable to call them survivors, but not in the sense of an illness, but in the sense of troubles in their life. Now back to, the, to my master, the, the PowerPoint. <laughs> so what I told you, our research, we discovered that the voices are common human variations which me, by meeting people uh, who never became patients, but also by, by the, uh, and mainly by the research, the, uh, how do you call it, uh, epidemiological uh, uh, population surveys in which we found and others found, we didn't that, but uh, uh, Chen did it first in 1992, in, on a uh, study of uh, an American study in the, uh, in the population of 1987, and there he found this 4%, and one of his colleagues repeated and found the same little, the same number of people hearing voices without becoming patients. That's a very important thing to remember. For as well in relation to the patients who hear voices, because that's your argument to normalize it. And it's also your argument to give hope to the people, because it's very important to give hope. Because now this diagnosis doesn't give much hope. So it's good that we also change that attitude. But then the second step is that this hearing voices, uh, and that's the same for paranoia and the same for the social retreat, they are influencing each other. They are often connected to each other, but not because they have illness, but because when you hear voices, you need, uh, you, you logically ask yourself what's going on. And so you think about what could it be, and what could it be, you also recognize the voice of somebody. So you might tell <coughs> that your voice is a voice, if you are open enough, but then most people are not open because never anybody listens to them. But if it is, is there anything wrong? No. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, somebody, thank you. Oh, that's nice. You think I'm getting a little bit harsh. <laughs> Might well be. That's a real nurse. Eh? She feels it uh, more early than I do. That's great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, this common human variations have also a meaning in the life of the, of the person. And that's more important then we realize, because if an experience first, you really hear these voices, then it's important it should be accepted by others. The second thing is, it is important to learn to know the relationship between what the voices say and when they come, what, and what has happened into, in your life. So that's a total other approach than make just diagnose it as an illness, because that stops the road to any further development. So the whole uh, approach is development, not cure. Because you don't cure voices, nobody will. You change your relationship with them. And that's why also people who hear voices and never became patients are inspired by them. So that's like authors in, from books yeah, get their uh, person from them. Or Dickens already did that, but still we know 
authors who use their voices as inspiration for their uh, figures in their uh, in their books and so but also in very different ways like when a person has lost his uh, his loved one late or early they might hear the voice quite over some time because that's quite normal to keep contact with somebody and surely when these people are also musically gifted that is the nice thing when we tomorrow will have this choir. I also wanted to have an orchestra of voice ears because most voice ears ha play, a, uh, play a, an instrument or are singing in a choir. But that is quite a, a thing to organize, so we never came to that. And it's, I never found anyone who wanted to do that. But here in Ireland, I uh, perceive they did a kind of thing like that. And what is naturally very important is that voice, uh, voices and the other uh, symptoms have causes while we don't know the cause of the schizophrenia disease. These facts came, uh, was, was, was a reason for us to describe the recovery process because what we did, I let me have that book for a moment, sorry. I forgave you all of them, but I need it in this uh, talk. Uh, I can tell a lot about, but I thought for you uh, practitioners, it's also important to know how, is, how it is to recover, what, ha what they have to do and how you have to support them. So I thought it might be an idea to uh, talk a little about the recovery process. But the, because that is step by step, and we learned it from the voiceers themselves, because in this book, The Living with Voices, there are 50 stories of people who recovered from the hinder of the voices. They still most hear voices, but they have changed the relationship with them. And that is rather important because then the, the hindering is changed, for instance, into a, uh, no, a positive, like uh, one of the first in this book is, um, sorry, just have a look, because uh, my memory still leaves a little bit of holes from time to time, and where it is. <laughs> And I, ah, yeah, that's the Swedish woman, Ami Ronitz, and she, she is uh, on page 104. She tells us about her voices when she has lived six years on the street, she had no, and then she got a, uh, a flat, but she didn't know what to do with that flat, and she was afraid of contacting other people because she was ashamed of having lived on the street. So she tried to contact, but it, she wasn't able to. So she heard their voices of the neighbors. And those voices said, what a mess do you look like? Or what a mess is this flat? And so they, she was perceived them as very negative and critical. And that was right because after a while when she learned to know the relationship between her voices and her problem in the time that she didn't have a relationship with the neighbors, then she discovered that these voices were right. When she got for the mirror, she had, she, they, they said, what a mess. So then she learned that she had to care more for herself to make contact with others. But that wasn't been, hadn't been necessary in the six years she was, she was on the street. So these voices can be very helpful if you understand what they say. This is quite a clear example. Mostly it's more difficult to get to know what is, but for, it takes always quite some time to realize that the voices are your voices. Nobody has the same voices. That's also strange that we make a diagnosis of people's problems while we know that everybody has different voices. So there is, when it was a biological thing, 
like tinnitus, you would have the same thing with everybody. That is not such a difference between. Here you see that it is related to what in the person is develop, or is, is uh, playing an important role. She had to clean her flat and she had to be care, caring herself to make contact with others. That she learned because on a walk she found somebody who uh, gave lectures in, uh, in um, how is the uh, first city, uh, Stockholm. And so she came into contact with uh, accepting voices translated in Swedish. And that made her looking, read it, and then she started thinking because she was quite an intelligent person. But it needs to be supported. That's where it is, where you have to start. There are three phases, uh, as I learned, but also from this, but also Mary is said uh, to me, it is step by step. Don't start and think you will help a person to get rid of his voices. First of all, that's not possible. Secondly, you have to go the whole road of developing. And development isn't that easy, so it's really difficult to support them step by step. And the first phase of it is the startling phase, we call that. That's when they still are overwhelmed by the voices and are afraid of them. So one of the first thing is to meet a person who is interested in the person of the voice here. And that's what you, the role you can play as a nurse, being start to be interested, not only in the symptom, but in the person, because that's one of the big troubles of mental health. People are seen as assemblies of, of symptoms, you said. But I think in your profession, you're still educated that you have a person in relation which, with whom you will act. And that is, uh, that is what, a, what is very important to, to a person, to be seen as a person, and then one of the aspects of that person, only one of the aspects, is hearing voices and having other symptoms. So that, the second thing is in that phase is being given hope and shown a way out by someone. So someone who knows that there are many more people hearing voices who never became patients, so normalize the situation. Then what is very important also is meeting someone who accepts the voices as real. And they are real because also biologically they are real because when somebody hears voices, they, uh, on the brain scan you find activation of the uh, speech center and some memory centers. That depends on the kind of voices are heard. And when it's related to memory, which is quite often because of what has happened in life and people involved with that, so it is a lot of memory involved in the voices. So meeting somebody to accept that is very important because you can imagine if nobody listens to you, you start being silent. You don't go on talking about something to somebody who won't listen. You can be angry with him, but it doesn't have any sense to talk to somebody who doesn't listen. And if you don't take it as real, you say to the person you are mad, in fact. You make his self-esteem, which is already not very high because of what has happened in their life, you even make that worse by doubting the reality. So you help them the wrong, to the wrong direction. And then exercising coping strategies to get more control and to reduce anxiety. So you see, really, interventions comes not at the first place. First place, you have to make a relationship with a person. Secondly, you have to show a way out and giving hope. And thirdly, you have to accept the symptoms and the complaints. And that's more difficult, it's less difficult with voices, anyhow for me, I think now, but still, I have difficulties with delusions. I always tend to say it can't be true. Very stupid. But you do that very automatically. And you have to, to reduce your ideas in that very much and change and really start listening. 
because people have a reason for their delusions. But they sometimes are so queer, these delusions, that you automatically say it can't be true. Okay. So that's more even difficult and surely for a psychiatrist to always exercise and trained to say, in fact, no to the patients who have symptoms of psychosis. A crazy profession, you would say. And I hope you do that different. So exercise and coping strategies to get more control and reduce anxiety is important, but goes step by step. We have described that in Making Sense of Voices, but there are more literature about <clears throat> small techniques to reduce anxiety and to have the person realize that he has more control. Also, the fact that he doesn't hear all the time voices is a sign of control, because otherwise the voices would be all the way there. Then you have a technique that you can make an appointment with the, with the voices to meet each other in the evening when you have time, because people try not that they don't that they don't hear the voices but that's impossible they just are there so you have to make a system of reducing the time of hearing the voices so you can but you have to engage with them and that's very difficult to engage with somebody <coughs> for whom you have anxiety you are anxious about what the voices say but Voices have no feet and arms. They can, cannot do, in fact, anything. What they can do and make and do is makes you anxious and try, try to convince you that they are powerful. But all the power they have, the voice here gives them. They have no other power than suggestive power. There is nothing they can do themselves. And then you will have examples of coincidences where they convince you, because voices are very convincing you about their problems. You accept that, but you say possibly it is not the only truth. We would like to try to get also some control, because it are typically your voices. They are with you. So that are little steps you first try, to get more control and reduce anxiety. And also cognitive therapy has a lot of techniques to reduce anxiety. Then the second phase of development, because the whole process is a developmental process. It has not a medical cure system. It doesn't belong there. This, the supporting the voice here to extend their interest in the voice hearing experience. Oh yeah. You can imagine that if you live with voices, you can do all the time, deny and try to get rid of them, but that's tiresome. It's very tiresome, but, it's but it gives anxiety. But you have to support the voice here to, to extend their interest, to get more interest in their voices and that you can do because you can say, you are totally ha hearing different voices from the other person's hearing voices. And that's nice in a group. You can really realize together that uh, each has his own voices. There is no double one. They never tell, oh, I have that same voice. They can tell they have that same influence, but they don't have the same voice. And so. The difference of voices make it an interesting thing because why are you hearing voices is a, a nice question to think about. You can't fill that in, but you can support people thinking about it. And making that step is already quite difficult that it is their voices because they don't experience it as their voices. And that's also not a denial because they really hear different voices but only they, of he or she, hears that voice. And that you can show in the group, whoever tells about another voice. Nobody tells about the same voice. 
they don't have the same voice as his, as his neighbor in the group. So that you can uh, anyhow, you don't have to push that, but you can make them realize that it's a personal situation. What they, and therefore, it's interesting what they say, what has that to do with you? In what kind of thing? And when they are coming forward, like with triggers, why should you just react on that situation? And so you have a lot of questions to discuss in the group about what's going on in my head. And because you accept the voices as real, but you also accept that they have personal meaning. Because they are only there for you, for nobody else. So then you discover the personal aspects of their voice, of these voices. And then the, there are links between the characteristics of the voices and the voiceers' problems. Therefore, you have this interview you can discuss in the group because step by step, first being realized that you have some control, you can tell about them. First, somebody who doesn't want to tell about them. They first have to see in the group that it's safe, that it doesn't lead to more medication and all that kind of things. And then you can have these uh, uh, interests stimulated and the interest gets you to the interview and to the, and, uh, and to the relationship to the characteristics and the, um, and the problems. So let's have a look in before because I don't know what's coming up. Oh yeah, thank you, sorry. <laughs> I have it anywhere here, but uh, I'm not glasses on, so I, I see you very well, but I don't see this very well. <laughs> uh, sorry. This, um, this, the, the interview gives you the possibility to, uh, to uh, get more knowledge about the voices of the person, and that is also possible to discuss in the group. And then you can um, try to find out very special things that are the, the age of the voices. Mostly people know the age of their voices, not all, but uh, the age, and the age is often not growing with the age of the person. The age of the voice, of one of the voice anyhow, is mostly related to the age that has happened something to them. So that's quite uh, general that the age of the voices stay the age that traumatic experience has happened or ended. And or has happened something when the voice started. That is another aspect which you have to explore quite intensely together in the group. When did it really start and what had happened in that time? That is difficult because that focus already on those things that a lot of people try to hide. A lot of people try to hide their troubles, their, what has happened. But you, you, that because the voice is forbid about that and also it's a developmental process to learn to know and to realize and to accept that what has happened has really happened. That's very difficult, uh, because otherwise you wouldn't have heard voices. If you could easily accept what has happened, would be more a way you could cope with what has happened. And we know that what has, there are in research now about five issues which are proven related to a higher chance of uh, psychosis, that is sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, emotional neglect, and uh, being, um, being bullied over longer periods. But there are much many more problems, only these ones were statistically. Yeah, then it has to be often, if it is. That's the trouble with research. They think that only statistics is giving the truth, but that's not a, that's not a reality. The reality is, the, the truth is within the person's experience in relation to his person's uh, life sto story and what has happened. That's why you are doing individual work and in the group while they tell each other about their voices. 
not because they are diagnosed. Uh, therefore, you don't need a group. Huh? You can just neglect them and give them medication. That's enough. You don't have to do anything. Here, you have to work hard to support people who are afraid of what they experience and are afraid of what has happened to them. So that makes that you have to give a lot of support. And so you work through the shame and the guilt feelings about what has happened. And that you can do in general. You can naturally also in general in the firm you can have invite somebody who is sexually abused and have him to tell you what are the problems of sexual abuse in later life. How long that goes on, all this. Because people don't realize themselves how much influence things from your use have on your later life. They don't realize you don't stand still with that. You have to stand still a lot in this process to what has really happened. And then by standing still, you are confronted with something you would not like to have happened. So there's a conflict in your mind, in fact, about it. And then the last, that could be also this, the stimulating the voice here to take back power. You will read that in this book, in the stories very much. It's an important step to get, to get the power back. Because all the power the voices have, you have given them. But it's not that easy to, give, to take the power back. So you can do that with little examples for people who've done that and then they ask the voices to do the washing up next day. And then nothing has happened. <laughs> they are really not powerful. They can't do anything. You have to give them, you have to question them and then you will perceive that they can't do all those things. So that slowly makes you doubting about their power. And you have to build up doubt about their power to, to realize that they have no power at all, but that they suggest having very much power. And when there is, <coughs> when you have taken back a lot, uh, some power, you also can make choices. Because that's very important in life to choose what you want to li in life, how and how to reach that. That is next to the voices, that's a general issue. That's the stabilization that means the recovery. In fact, to live in our society, you have to make choices. You can't just hide beside, behind symptoms or complaints. You can, but it doesn't work. You never get anywhere. So you have to realize that the only way is to make choices. And we hear that of people recovered, that they made choices, which is a very difficult point. And so it has to be stimulated all the time. They have to make an, they have to look at advertisement. They have to just write up in the group, what do I want to, to become? Yeah? Because otherwise they think we just stay where we are. And that's not the meaning of development. It's easier with children, but older people, I would say adults and uh, are, already often a long time not doing what they should do and haven't made a choice because that was forbidden by the voices. So you really are up to a very forceful power. That is the suggestive power of the voices. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry. And then the stimulated to make choices and then out finding out how to change their relationship with their voices. Some people, for instance, are only hearing voices when they are angry because they, or either they can't become angry themselves. So they have learned at home not to be angry. In itself, it's a nice way, but it doesn't bring you through life. You can't. You don't have to overdo it like me, because my daughter said, I, well, it was my 80th birthday last year, she said in public in the, at my party, she said, I think there's nobody in this, uh, how do you call that, in this, who has never been angry, uh, been having a, a fight with Marius. Because um, <laughs> she's really right in that sense. I mean, I like fight. And, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So I'm not that problem, or you could say you have a problem, but that is just as you like it. But uh, people, <clears throat> you can't be angry, you have to learn to be angry. You have really make them angry or give possibilities to express anger. And that, that needs some, uh, some, uh, <clears throat> some, uh, some creativity. To, to, uh, and the same is naturally with uh, self-esteem. When people have a low self-esteem, they have to do things that heighten their self-esteem. And so you have to support them doing things that heighten their self esteem. That is in connection with choices, but you have to exercise. Without exercise, you don't come anywhere. And then we heard yesterday a very extreme exercise of somebody who uh, did uh, run a whole night of uh, 38 kilometers to get over a resistance. Now that's not really necessary for everybody, but it is necessary to, <coughs> to uh, to change your relationship with your voices and that is for heightening self-esteem because most traumatic experiences lower self-esteem very much. Then the last thing is exploring with the voices and that's very important. Also they're all important but here how possibly their voices could express their own emotions. Because when you have trouble with anxiety, with uh, aggression, you uh, when the no let's say it this way when the voice makes you aggressive you have a problem with aggression that seems that you can't be aggressive yourself so you that is exploring with the voice here how the voice ex express their own emotions so when a voice makes you aggressive the voice express your emotion of aggression, which you can't express. So you have to learn to express aggression. And that kind of thing with identity, with self-esteem, with all the things of uh, self-efficacy, you all have to, all the qualities of self, you have to exercise with the person. Okay, how far are we? I think we have had, I would, these are now getting only uh, examples. I can give some examples, but I don't know what you like. You give it a, a pause and ask questions, or what do we do? Uh, Mary, you are the leading person here. I always <laughs> like to have others to decide. I'm not a voice here, but, and I'm quite aggressive, but I also like <laughs> others to help me. <laughs> Huh? We've got about 50 minutes left, so if you want to go through maybe a few quotes and then we'll stop and ask questions. That's okay. okay, yeah, that's okay. I go a, li a little. Now I take on my glasses because I can't read it otherwise. So the first, <clears throat> that was one of the steps, the first steps in the, uh, in the first phase. You need somebody. Uh, I was spoken to as a person. Yeah, what I said, hey, it's not only a, a, a person with symptoms, but it was a person. I became an identity. You were interested. I am. This person was an American who lived in Holland, and um, as if it was somebody Derek Corstens uh, worked with over some time. And he uh, was, first of all, medicated much too much, so that is terrible. And small amount of medication, when that works, uh, and when that not works, a bigger amount doesn't work better. That's very well uh, looked after in, uh, in Sweden, because that's one of the things. Some doctors think if you give more, it will help more. That's not the case. That's the case with drinks, with what? No, nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing. So I don't know why these doctors think that, but I mean, there is hardly anything when you take more is better. But uh, anyhow, with medication, it's not the case. I became, <clears throat> and then 
he was in fact a creative person, but he was just a dumb person after when he came to Der Der Carstens. And so he told about that he anyhow in his life he had written in a theater play, and so Derek was interested in that theater play. You also have to talk about yourself. You have to go through this, this uh, training ID that you have to take a big distance to a person. No, uh, care is taking, uh, coming near to a person, and therefore you have to talk about yourself as well as talk about the person. <clears throat> So this person was, had written a, a theater play, and Derek was interested in the theater play. Before that, I was treated as a patient, lived in no man's land, and there was a cessation of my feelings. Now that is with lots of medication, you get that uh, reaction. You don't feel yourself anymore. And then you can't recover, because you need your feelings to live in our society, to make decisions, to make choices. You therefore, it's all emotional. And not having a cup of tea, but have the emotions. And that's the difficulty. Yeah, when all this uh, place on the television, my wife likes uh, Sandra likes it very much. Did I say I did this study with Sandra? I always have to do that because she's very important in our, uh, in our research because she was a uh, a journalist when I met her. And when she came to my, uh, <clears throat> I had a uh, group in the faculty where I uh, was, uh, uh, let's say the psychiatry group in, uh, in the medical, uh, she might well ring. I mean, that's the kind of thing. <laughs> huh? You hardly, that's our contact, I suppose. I'm so sorry, but I'll have to ask one minute. Yeah, hello. Hi. I don't hear anything. It might also be that then this phone thinks I'm in England, which is not right. No, okay, we'll do it later. Sorry. I have a kind of, um, how do you call that relationship? When we think of each other, that we, do, we think at the same time. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, let's go back to the, ah yeah. Giving hope was one of the, the, the issues in the first phase. And then Antje is one of the Germans. She was the uh, network coordinator in Berlin. My mother was very warned and war worried. And then she heard of the German Hearing Voices Network. My mother went there, participated in a group and told me about it. But I really didn't want to know. She left a flyer called Accepting Voices. That was our book, which she calls it the flyer, but doesn't matter. We just <laughs> listened. <laughs> but we keep what the patient says. Eh? We don't change that. <laughs> okay. She left a flyer called Accepting Voices on the desk by my bed. I read it. I was very surprised that the psychiatrist was writing in a different way about voices. So that is giving hope because we do that already in that book. That was one of the first things we discovered in relation to voice ears, accept them and giving hope. Uh, meeting people who accept the voices as real, that's Ron Coleman, I know you have, might have heard of him, he has done the most work in spreading it out on the world, getting it to Australia, America and all kinds of countries. He really lives on our work, and that's very nice because it's a very active person. Sometimes people think he's a bit too active, but I must honestly say he's really a great guy. But um, he writes Anne Walton because we met him when he still was really looking a schizophrenic, eh? like no reactions. No, re then when he first he was member of the first group Paul Baker started in uh, Manchester. And Walton was one of these groups, and he entered a fellow voice ears who, at my first hearing voices group, asked me if I heard voices. When I replied that I did, she told me that they were real. And it doesn't sound like much, but that one sentence has been a compass, sh compass showing me the direction 
I needed to travel and underpinning my belief in the recovery process. Because that is what he is telling in that it is telling you that you're not mad, that you really have something to exp have something to experience and there is any sense to that. Using coping strategies to get more control over the voices, that is Stuart from Manchester. Yeah, Ron is now living up in Scotland. He is a typical Scot. He also, on his first, we flew with him to America, Ron Coleman, the first time, and he never had flown before. Flown before. And he so put on his uh, kilt because he said, when it drops down, they anyhow know I was there. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not only the symptom, it's also socially you have to recover a lot. Because you have been a lot into the situations where you had no, you're not your own direction. And so he had to relearn a lot of social things and that's with all of them. Because hospital is not the best place to be. Stuart, he is not mean much in hospital, that's nice. I was already able to talk back to my forces with my thoughts, but Learn to make a specific time of day, the evening when I would focus and simply tell the voices later if they come up at another time. Oh, tell the voices later when he had this uh, appointment, when they come at another time. That's one example of a, an, uh, a uh, coping strategy. Well, I told you already. That's the... Uh, Example of Ami, who become actively interested in the hearing voices experience when she really also learned what they had to tell her of, which was in fact of profit of her. I told about her, uh, she, it's terrible, and except the voices described man for, said there is reason, but I think I did a better explanation she only said that she become actively interested because she read this Accepting Voices book, but then <clears throat> she became more knowledgeable about, because these voices, that was Amy who told her, you are a mess and it's a mess here. And then she later thought about, oh, but they are right, I should take care of myself and my flat. Is it enough, you think? Shall we go to, to, to questions? Absolutely. Um, um, good. I just explain about the, the question for anyone who wants to ask a question. If, do, we, do you think we need mics for a question? No, no we're okay. But be very loud because I'm yeah. quite <laughs> dire deaf. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, look, we'll try it without and see how we go. Okay, question up there. Uh, people in? An adult who doesn't have any insight whatsoever into the fact that they're having voices and that they're totally isolated from the world Yes, I think so, because that a person has retreated himself from social contact means that nobody has ever listened to him, and so he gave up uh, talking about his voices. So you think the best thing is to start and analyze with the family how the process has developed. Start not at the end, where the, the, the symptom is hindering the family as well as the person, but trying to find out where they did not be cooperative together and accept what he has experienced and what he has told about it. And because otherwise they stay in denying the problem and only seeing the symptom. 
So I think you, when you want to, uh, to, to get the cooperation of the family, you have to analyze how the process have, have slowly developed. Because he, that, what you now describe is the end situation. It didn't start that way, I suppose, because mostly it doesn't start that uh, in isolation. A second possibility is, <coughs> but that is with the person itself, that nobody ever listened to him, so that you can ask, <coughs> and never any person believed. His voices will, in the beginning, very much be against talking because they were never believed. So they are not very helpful at that moment. Therefore, it is good to visit this kind of person regularly, be nice to him and build up a relationship. Not start with the symptom, build up a relationship. And when you have build up a relationship, you can start also with the troubles he has with mental health issues but not start with the issues. You have a person who just is not relating to anybody. So he needs somebody who relates to him. And, and, I, and I would be exempt that, but if the person... What are you talking? Yeah. Louder. Yeah. If, if the person um, uh, doesn't see it as a problem and is so cut off and is not communicating at all, um, they don't see it as, as a problem, even though they might be living in total poverty, and, but, but they don't see it as a okay. problem. You don't, you don't have to see it as a problem. For a relationship, the, the, what you do is you want to therapy. You don't therapy in this phase. You start making a relationship. That is, you help him with things that he needs. He doesn't have to agree with you. That's already a step far above his possibility at that moment. You have just to be of any help with his household. I did do the, the, the sink was uh, that kind of thing, the very practical thing. That makes a relationship and then we will open up. But not when you start talking about, oh, you have a problem. I mean, they don't go and listen to you. Everybody has said that already 10, 20 times. That's not a relationship. So I think it is starting at a total other end than being a care uh, 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 professional. But you have to be a professional to build up a relationship with somebody who doesn't want anything. And that's what you describe. He doesn't want anything, he denies everything, but he has needs. He likes to have something nice from time to time. He has to have some help with his household. You can see what he, uh, you're nurses, you're also women. Even men can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> mm. Sorry, bad joke. <laughs> Good. Who are? I, I work as a wellness facilitator. Wellness facilitator. That's what it's called. Good. And I work with people who have mostly using psychiatric services as yeah. well. Yeah. A, that's a, a handicap. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a big split. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of somebody yesterday when we suggested she went and she was worried about medication, got information about medication, and that was seen as a problem that she was getting sick. She was seen as... She was sick because oh. she was questioning what exactly oh, yeah. is this oh. doing. And he was quite concerned about that. Oh. Now, it's I, time he answers the question or not. No, he didn't. He doesn't, no. And she was afraid to push it because she didn't want to go back uh -huh. to hospital. So you have to help her self-esteem of well, asking. I work with her self-esteem, but I'm just wondering, I mean, we, we try to work it in a recovery way, but in Ireland, psychiatric services seem to me to be split. Half yeah. of them are going in recovery and half of them are stuck in the old medical What is happening to you when you join your patient to the psychiatrist and go together? Well, I have suggested that and that it's a possibility that we will. Uh, I think it's important she chooses who she goes with. The, yeah, the she, but she chooses that she goes with because she can't herself yet. Exactly. 
So she has to choose someone. Yeah. But, but the, the question really is about this, though, that I would be talking in this way to people. Yeah. But if people then go back to their psychiatrists and talk in this way, whoop, some of them. Okay, the then you have to join them too because they still don't know how to handle their psychiatrist. That's one of the things you have to learn as a, as a patient. Yeah. And possibly he has more elegance towards you than to the patients because he's too much dominating the situation. As said, because he knows well in this way and that is not the case. So you have to, 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 to learn the patients to come up for himself or herself. That's the only way. That's building up a relationship also. And then you can have more talk about, so they are both <clears throat> not one enemy, but you have both someone you have to change a little bit, and that gives a relationship, and on that relationship you can build on talking about her problems, or first about the significance of her uh, uh, complaints. I don't know how it takes that. Okay, no, but she might have also psychiatric complaints or not. What she does with it, she goes for nothing to that psychiatrist or? She would be on a medical card, yeah. On? No, a medical treatment. She would be paid, it would be paid for by the state. She doesn't pay for it. No, but that's not a problem. Does she have complaints about her psychiatrist? No, she has a complaint for which she goes to the psychiatrist. Symptoms. She has symptoms. Yeah, what are the symptoms then? Okay, not good. And so, when you build up a relation by joining her to uh, to the psychiatrist and to talk about the medication and how it works, and so you build up a relationship with her, and so you have more chance and openness about her voices. I think. Well, I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Karen, um, I have a question around research. I'm just wondering. Two things. Firstly, do you feel that the qualitative research over the last 20 years... <laughs> you think I have that in my head? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, make it a bit easier. Yeah. But, I mean, you, you documented qualitatively the conference in 87 and all of the, the experiences of voice hearers yeah. in, in a very good way and compiled them. So, do you feel that that body of research is, is now enough to push the, the approach forward uh, in terms of people forming groups? And the other part of the question is... Oh, I do one word at a time, yes, okay, okay. because it has no sense to take two questions. Uh, so, my answer is I have a whole list of things that should be researched, because there are a lot of things that are not researched well enough. But it's not my business if it's going on, because the hearing voices people are going on. And I am happy that they do, because they, are, they have a positive effect of it for their lives. But for, to convince professionals, there is a lot more research to be done, and we have made a whole list of that. So, for instance, we have not officially uh, evaluated, or how do you call that, our interview. It has helped many people and it was, it's very clear that's their experience, but we never made a research project of it. And so there are a lot of things we just developed and used and, were the, and the critics were from the voice ears and they used it and they went on with it like Peter Boulimar has instructed in here about the interview, Maastricht interview. So we have a lot of the voices themselves get going. It doesn't, we can't stop that anymore. I would, don't want it, but I mean, there's enough difference between the research to be done and the enthusiasm of these voices. Yeah? Um, I think kind of answers my second question, oh. which, which is about that, the, the, the future direction or focus of the research. Um, what would be at the top of, of that list for you? Oh la la. <laughs> now I have a whole list and then you take a... The best thing is, I think, to ask Eleanor Longdon. She is the one who in the Hearing Voices movement 
is uh, has the task of uh, organizing the or and also identifying the research questions. I wouldn't say what is most important. Uh, we have a whole list, and that's very difficult because in research. The main issue is that the one who does the research is interested in the research. It's not a question, it's the person who decides what, and sometimes I like that and sometimes I don't, but that's not the trouble. The trouble is in this life that people, and that's good, it's not only trouble, decide themselves what to do. And that might be more important and less important, but it's important that they are interested. Life is, that, that's good, that's the same with voice ears, we, we do, should not decide for them. So if you want to know what is, then you take that list from her, and I think it is, I send it also to uh, from the, dub, uh, the, the uh, uh, University in the north of England, they have a Project of Hearing Voices, Durham. Durham, thank you, yes, we have been there three months and still I forget names, and Angela Wood is a very nice person and I have sent her the whole list of things that are still to be researched, so you can ask her for that too, because the main thing is that you look at the things and then decide what you think is uh, in your situation has the most sense. Hi, yeah, good. <laughs> I'm afraid you have to louder speak. I rather not think about that because it has nothing to do with the person. The trouble is that I think you have to interfere when the person has a need for help. And that can be earlier and later. But we can't force our help on somebody who doesn't think it has any sense for him. It does, just doesn't, doesn't work. But in principle it would be nice to early, but then that means that in the early stage there would be also interest in the person when he has a problem. And so that starts, that in fact we did not work much about, with them, but that starts mostly with the GP or the social worker. So that kind of people also should be influenced in taking serious voices, uh, taking voices serious and do so. Ah, she still is there I think, but <laughs> let's have a look. No. Yeah, do you have all these kind of telephones who just go off? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody thinks that I know how to answer an SMS or read, but I can't. <laughs> I don't go that far. It's only for telephoning. You. Yeah. It comes down to a fundamental question of whether you think people um, need to be treated for their own good by professionals. And I'm thinking particularly of mental health laws, mm -hmm. because um, I have to get my head around this to speak to lawyers, we assume. Yeah. And they have this, um, some people say we, do not, we should not have mental health laws because they discriminate against a person and give people per permission to... Um, treat people for their own good. But you have the Convention on Human Rights which argues that people need to be treated or should be treated according to their own will and preferences. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of putting the person at the centre and, and working with what they need. Where There seems to be a big gap Different, between yeah. the two. What do you, where do you start to address that? I think it's a very difficult question to answer because we have a society and in this society we used to give, judge the behavior of other people and that's why we have all these laws because we don't really look at the person we 
primarily look at our society. And that you can criticize and think you are right in that, but you would not easily change. So the trouble is, how could you make the best of it in a certain situation? I don't think you can generalize because you never win that, to, that the whole of society will change and not just other people's behavior. We do that. We also fight wars. We do kind of difficult things. In, but you can help in this way that you can see if for certain problems it is helpful to have to use a law or not useful to, law, to use a law. But the principle is too difficult to change, I think. Yeah, we are living in a society that's not very ideal. I mean, yeah. But also very good things, but yeah. Our welfare, if you see the differences with Africa, we are well in a well-being situation. But we also regulate too much in, non, in not a very nice situation. So you have so many social trouble, social situations that we would like to change that we only can start very small level, I am afraid. Sorry, yeah. Gentlemen at the back there. Uh, you mentioned brain scan and voice hearing. Yeah. And you said that uh, the voice part of the brain is activated and very often the memory part of the brain is activated. That suggested to me there are times when the memory part of the brain may not be activated. So I'm wondering uh, what kind of situations those with, you know, what, what's happening there? What are the parts, if any, of the brain are being activated along with the voice, the voice um, part? Now, for instance, um, some voices are, uh, have the same characteristics as the person who abused the person. So, in that case, the voice remembers the person to the voice of the person who abused her or him. So that's one example of a memory action, when the voice ref uh, is uh, like the voice of the person who abused the person either, the, uh, and the persons who bullied people are carried with the person a long time in life, and they, when they hear them, they will also activate memory parts of the brain, because they are related to memories of the brain, of the person, and that's in the brain naturally there. There's a lot of us, we, of our memories we have, from use, we have stored in the, in the, in the brain, only we don't measure that, we do that with voices, and so with voices who are related to memories, they mostly more activate memory uh, centers. But are there, are, there, are there times, I thought you were suggesting there were times when the memory part of the brain is not activated? Yeah, that might be. <clears throat> Uh, I don't get an example, but there are people hearing voices who, uh, where the voices are more, now yesterday I had a talk, where the voices are more busy with the moments of now. It's more discussion between two persons. Discussion between the voices and the voice hearer. In that sense, you would have much more activation of the speech center than the memory center. Because that is in fact what is happening at this moment. It might be reflect memories of before, but the main issue what is playing in the situation is the discussion between the person and his voices. And then you might well have more uh, speech center activation. Because in fact that's what's happening. Part of the memory uh, being 
Yeah, it's always difficult to say all cases when you have very personal differentiations. I think mostly is, but that is, uh, yeah, we, nobody has done this research and see what the voices, how the voices communicate with the person and then measured if that is a change because those who do scans or brain scan are believing in biological values and they don't believe in this psychological interaction. So there has not been this kind of research. Only there has been kind of research which shows that while hearing voices you have different centers, but they did not differentiate what the voices at that moment were telling or how the voices were reflecting memories or speech with the voice here. They don't believe in that kind of differentiations because they see it as a biological problem. So that would be one of these interesting uh, research uh, issues. But uh, yeah, we have a lot of more where you can be more practically busy because you won't change these centers. But you are right, it's a good interested question to be uh, looked after. Man who has the voice of the devil. Yeah. And the devil says you are bad and you're going yeah. to the seventh Devils are seldom nice people, aren't they? <laughs> and not, your, your grandmother will also go to hell. And what? Your? your grandmother will also, who is dead, she will go to hell too. Yeah, yeah, no. So he is very afraid of the devil and he doesn't want to be in the presence of the devil. I wonder, could you say a bit more about how we might be able to help him? Yeah, I wonder too. I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's always difficult to have from parts or pieces thing together. But <clears throat> the devil stands also in the Old Bible, in the first uh, Old Testament, for the uh, judge who, um, in a judge situation, <clears throat> You have the judge and you have somebody who, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, formulates the, the klacht, uh, the... Jury. No, not the jury. Jury, uh, the jury is... The uh, huh? prosecutor. The prosecutor, thank you. So in the Old Testament, the devil is the prosecutor. So when you took here, the, the, when he hears the devil, you can look together how far this devil is prosecuting with what he says, him or his grandmother, but I think him. So that is, I think, the <coughs> translation of a devil as a voice. Like a god is a powerful po person and the devil is also a powerful experience as powerful and gods are powerful because they don't have names, they don't have ages, so they mystify who are they really representing. Um, I'm just, I'm Where are you? Ah, here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, um, I, I guess, what, what your own personal motivation has been since you, you've worked in this area for 28 years and you seem to have a great passion for it. So I'm just curious about ah. that aspect. Do you know the people who can define their own passion? No, I don't. I mean, that's very difficult to define. But I can tell you what was influencing me mostly is first of all this meeting people who never became patients. Then I always doubted about the diagnostic values of, of, uh, of psychiatry. So with my aggression, it was very nice to be able to fight them, isn't it? <laughs> And I was very happy that we did not do the same as the uh, anti-psychiatry movement in the 60s because they tried to change psychiatry. Now I had tried that already once in a social action in Holland and it succeeded in that way that the government uh, forbid to rebuild uh, psychiatric hospitals but 
and make smaller ones, etc. But after 10 years, they just changed again ideas. So it's not sensible to, to start changing the church and start changing. So I'm happy that we went with the voiceers. And what kept me going is that the voiceers are really profit of them. We always meet other voiceers who really tell enthusiastic about our approach. Now, that keeps you going. And this kind of receptions is also very nice, naturally. <laughs> huh? There's nobody who says, uh, fuck you. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so that keeps going. Yeah. Yeah, small, step by step. And I'll try to write it up also a little bit to get back to what, where did we find out that and where did it? Because this independence only was last year that we realized, <coughs> Sandra and me, that there is no relationship between this disease and the symptoms. So we did not accentuate that before. So now we go around with this issue this year. Huh? And possibly we have another next year. You never know. Because contact with voices makes you wiser. You always get new uh, th uh, ideas from them. And therefore, the contact with them is very important. And we do that yearly now in the uh, conference this year in Madrid. And 7 and 8 of November. As we are very happy of going there. You learn from that. You always see new people, you always see developed people, you see, you hear new things. So it's a very inspiring uh, conference for us. My, my question is um, of a holistic approach. Yeah. So as a counselling psychotherapist, yeah. I work with clients whose voices are their repressed emotions, their inner critic, yeah. Um, their abuser, their mother, their teacher in a negative way. But as a shamanic energy therapist, yeah. I also work with people yeah. whose voices are their inner knowing, their yeah. higher self, yeah. but can also yeah. be intrusive energies. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, on a mind-body spiritual side, what would you say about the, the, the kind of spiritual... Yeah, it is, it's yeah. a very nice combination what you do, but then... I think it is the challenge to see if you can stimulate the patient side, the negative side, into more the positive side. Because we think that changing the relationship with your voices, they become more inspiring. So it's a development of spirituality, which is part of the business. But you have to do it step by step. And I wouldn't be able to make these last steps because I have no experience in that. But it would be very nice if you could describe if that is possible to to, to waken up people in that sense. Yeah. Who? Hi. Ah. Yeah. I'm just um, I'm just wondering about what you said about the, about the disease concept or the illness idea. Yeah. And. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is that I, certainly I've encountered people and certainly I've read kind of public thoughts. Oh, too quick. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not there. You have. I'm not sitting in your place. I, suggest, okay, I, I just want to suggest that for some people at least, the idea of schizophrenia as an illness can prove useful. What do you think about that? Yeah, if you formulate it that way, <clears throat> it is always so. I know it is because my most e reasonable example is a person who, with his voices, tries to avoid his um, child, how do you call that, a sexual identity of being uh, uh, oriented on children, a pedophile. So being a pedophile is very difficult. And when you have voices that prevent you from being a pedophile, it is a helping hand. 
In that sense, we then decided to keep it what it was. And then schizophrenia has some social advantages because you can get a uh, illness uh, fee, uh, all that kind of thing. You have the advantages of being ill. In that kind of situations, the growth will hinder you. The trouble is we have no solutions for those people. And it's very difficult to keep your whole life without sexuality. You know that most people, priests, don't get that <laughs> fixed, as we know from... So the trouble is sometimes you have to accept that it's a problem not able to solve and then leave it. Don't change what is only a handicap, becoming a handicap. But it's only very few times, I met it anyhow, but it's also a few times people come to me with that kind of problems. It's both sides of it. But that's the example I just would, uh, yeah, as an explanation of giving a better excuse. Yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. take one last question. Yeah. We can't solve everything. No. I know. Um, I thought I'd just like to ask. Um, Are you there stalking at the end? Yes. Yes, good. In terms of possibility of using the approach for other disorders, you have to come down because I can't hear you. The possibility of using the, huh? the possibility of using the approach for other disorders, as such, yeah. such as hypomania, depression. Now we heard yesterday a person who was depressed and talked about, and uh, I don't know, is the brace or breast of yeah. Breast. No. <laughs> huh? Everyone knows Brandy. Okay. Now he talks the same story about his depression to my idea. So there's no reason not to use it in other way. We we secluded we, we, we reduced it to per, to be hearing voices because when we began nobody believed anything, so that is very well definable hearing voices. And it's accepting as something that exists. And, that you can, and it's easily to research because the, the category is clear as a research object. And we needed that kind, of, but it is a reduction of, because I believe in fact that, I, that this, uh, this um, dynamics is the same with most psychotic symptoms. Only the, the developed will be in different ways. A real convinced delusion is much more difficult to approach than hearing voices. So we took also not the most difficult one out of the series. And social retreat is not very well to define. So it's also helping us to get anywhere. I mean, you, are, you have to be a bit practical. Surely when the first time you tell about it, they think you are mad yourself. So you have to be prudent when you will to change something. And that's why I've learned to do social action never on your own. So on this first conference, we, with the group of Voiceers, started Resonance, this organization <coughs> of Voiceers. And I think that organization had immediately quite a number of members. Now uh, more or less, but at that time were thousands in a thousand in a short time, and I used them to keep my profession, my pro my uh, my uh, how do you call that? Uh, because I took the risk of getting fired as a professor of psychiatry. I didn't tell the right things, but they helped me. You don't say no to thousand people. They even in Holland don't dare to do that. So <laughs> they accepted it. But you have to do always social action, never on your own. That I learned before already. And my father is, uh, in, uh, has been very long time in a good position in politics, so I learned also a lot of them. <laughs> Not the aggression, I must say, that's my own. <laughs> good, thank you. I have finished it up. <laughs> thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
You're really entertaining. <laughs> good. Thank you. Very nice. Oh, she's good. Yeah.